Uh, okay, so uh, my name is Ryan Ross Smith, um, and uh, generally uh, I talk about my work with animated music notation, um, and I always try and put it in the context of what I consider to be kind of the, the field at large. So that includes a lot of different people, some people in this room. Um, but because of time, I'm going to focus more on my work. So um, I'm going to talk about three broad topics within the context of my work within this field of contemporary animated scoring practices. And these are uh, technology as impetus for notational development and how notation evolves, again, looking specifically about animated notation, uh, different types of control structures or the implications of these that I'm interested in, and how the audience figures into these types of performance situations. So just to get everybody up to speed, um, uh, I'll have a short clip after this of the kind of work I'm focusing on. And in this clip, you'll see 15 notational aggregates, larger circles, with a line going back and forth like a metronome. As it reaches each side, it indicates the performer to play with their right hand or with their left hand. OK, so very simple. Um, but the key thing to notice is that each performer is instructed exactly what to do and when to do it. So um, so uh, this first part, we'll come back to that piece. Um, but some technological developments may enable the creation of new notational forms. So looking back to uh, an, an example from 1886, what we have here is the key indicator for musical instruments, uh, in which there was a large uh, roll of paper that was pulled past a metal bar. And these marks, these black marks up here, would indicate the moments at which the student would press the key on the keyboard um, and which key it is, so by its vertical and horizontal location. So the idea being to enable students to um, engage with musical practices without having an understanding of uh, common practice notation. Uh, similarly, uh, Max Fleischer, uh, with his song cartoons, or the famous bouncing ball, to help people in uh, the sing-alongs uh, that would occur prior to a film showing, uh, apparently there was a problem and people weren't staying together. And so he solved this huge problem uh, with the bouncing ball, which of course goes to eventually karaoke. Again, uh, a mechanical or digital way to um, indicate the moment at which somebody, where they should be in a particular uh, word or verse. And then the most ubiquitous of all, Guitar Hero. Uh, we've color-coded cursors descending these lanes the moment that they hit the bottom node, you play the corresponding button on your guitar controller. And so a mechanical example, a film example, uh, digital examples. Um, uh, but in, so in all of these cases, the dynamic functionality of the score demonstrates a particular kind of control. By limiting the performer's interpretive responsibilities and requiring adherence to an unwavering timeline. And yet it is also this control structure that enables access uh, by an extended range of performer abilities. OK, so certainly a large part of this evolution and the evolution of contemporary animated scoring practices specifically, it's through, well, not specifically, but for the con in this context, um, is through its usage and reflexive relationship that develops between the score in performance and the composer's analysis of how well it functions. As changes are made to facilitate a more efficient performance situation, for instance, the notational language develops. And naturally, as a community develops around a field of notational practice, which I believe is happening at this moment, uh, ideas are borrowed, shared, developed, recycled, and perfected. And lastly, and perhaps less important, is the codification of terminologies corresponding to those notational elements found in a notational practice in general. So in the case of animated music notation, I have made some feeble attempts at codifying some of the low-level elements found in my scores and in the field of practice in general. And a process like this can also extend to the high-level terminologies, such as score functionality or the naming of one's particular notational style. So just as a demonstration, here is a uh, beginnings of a list 
compiled, uh, that I compiled that reflects on the terminological diversity found in descriptions of these types of scores. I know it's pretty much impossible to read, but uh, so it's full of citations, but it's something like 26 different ways that people are describing things that I would say are animated notation. Okay, so I'm going to now look briefly at how I think about the use of control in my own works to efficiently communicate to performers and democratize performance situations. So the first type of control results from the persistence of the score. The performer is often faced with a persistent flow of information or notation, with the score often requiring one to respond with a direct one-to-one -one reaction or response as the score is being generated in some cases. Uh, the performer cannot look away, but is tethered to the screen. Um, the second is the performer is often required to mirror the motion of the score with their actions. Uh, one might draw the analogy of the score pulling the strings of the performer's marionette. And again, the persistence of the score's dynamic elements contributes to this particular or peculiar, peculiar relationship. Um, third, the score is often visible to both the performers as well as the audience. While there is certainly the expectation of the perfect, in quotes, performance in professional settings and other settings, to privilege the notational information in this way exerts a unique sense of social control uh, in that it may be possible for the audience to see the mistakes, for example. Uh, and last, the performer is often required to dismiss most or all of their interpretive leanings in order to accu accurately realize what is represented by the score and must often uh, put more faith in their eyes than in their ears in order to avoid being swayed by the rest of the ensemble. So my interests are in, in, in uh, being explicit about the fact that it's not important to listen and being explicit about the fact that you have to watch and be very careful that you do exactly uh, what is represented on the screen and not to interpret, which I will be extremely contrary about in the concert today. Um, so again, returning to this piece, the aforementioned ideas and functionalities enable the efficient representation and realization of complex rhythmic relationships. So in this case, I'll play it again. Um, the, the 15 percussionists are sustaining 15 unique uh, but proportionally related tempi. So a, a challenging uh, problem in any kind of notational style, I believe. So uh, lastly, the projected score and audience integration. Um, performances utilizing animated scores will often, but not always, feature a large-scale projection of the score for both the audience and the performers. And I would argue that there are several reasons for this. Um, first, the impracticality of distributing, of distributing the score amongst several small monitors or iPads, um, which, is, which is certainly what people are doing. The Decibel Ensemble is doing this um, to great effect. Um, but if you don't have access to that, uh, the practical solution is to just pro project it for everybody. Um, it's, and then you sometimes have this problem where the screen is literally curved, which is pretty wild. Um, not this screen, that screen. Okay, so uh, now while the projected score may at times be a practical solution for some composers, the score may also serve as a visual backdrop of sorts, a kind of uh, dynamic set design. Um, so some notations can be easily deciphered from the often one-to-one -one relationships spoke about before between the on-screen movements and the performer's physical slash musical response, which can be used as a method to incorporate audience interaction or to promote audience understanding. This particular notational methodology may make it possible for audience members to quickly develop an understanding of this relationship by recognizing the correspondence between the performers and the score. I say may make it possible. I think absolutely it is happening. Okay, so the phrase, the trappings of choice from the beginning, this is my last slide, is indeed a very Cajun concept and in the case of animated scores is often apparent on both sides of the score. The performer is generally taught to find his or own personal interpretation of any given store in a traditional context 
but the performer faced with the score featuring the kind of control referenced thus far must necessarily reject the possibility of any significant personalized interpretation, at least in the traditional sense. The real-time persistent behavior of these scores is a huge contributing factor. The performer simply does not have time to develop a personalized version of the score. Uh, and if an accurate performance is desired, must simply follow the instructions. But again, by replacing the notational barrier, as it were, with simple and efficient dynamic indicators and removing any expectation that, performer, that the performer inject his or her understandings of how one might interpret a piece of music, it is possible to enable participation across a range of abilities and experience, albeit under the guise of persistence and control, while encouraging or at least enabling audience understanding. Thanks. Um, I was wondering, because you were saying that if, if you're in the audience and you're watching the score, then you can see whether performers are getting it right, so to speak. Um, do you sometimes, does that sometimes bother you? Do you sometimes not want the audience to know exactly how you are manipulating the performers and therefore choose maybe to use a tablet? Um, I, I personally like... The, uh, I personally like to project the score and to make it available. Um, again, a lot of this comes from practicality, but this is how I started and just got used to it. Um, I, uh, you know, the, like I mentioned, uh, the Decibel Ensemble before really are, um, oh, and of course the work Chris and Alice are doing with, with iPads, I, I think it's a wonderful way to go with it. and. Um, sort of preserves that mystery. But I also li like the beauty of seeing the score, and um, it almost has a kind of DIY aesthetic to it in some regard. So it may be, yes, that at some point it would be more interesting to preserve that mystery, but to this point, not so much for me. Thank you. So uh, thank you for the presentation. Well, I have a question. Um, in short, is there a notation be behind your animated notation? I mean, did you, uh, did you have a language to describe your animated score? Did you create that or uh, oh, in do you have tools for composing an animated score or, um, or not? Do you mean in terms of uh, how I would talk about it or how I would actually write, put the piece together? The second. Um, I, well, I stick with a few kind of fundamental indications. So primarily um, convergence I find works very well. Um, contact and intersection work very well. Uh, and so if I was working on a new piece, I would probably be thinking, can I already use these kinds of functionalities? Because they seem already very efficient and very effective. Uh, then. But if uh, we're interested in doing a different kind of music, I think I would have to think about what the what the next step might be. Does that kind of answer your question? Yeah. So. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Great. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. 